Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. You know, the, um, the other day I was in a, um, a church and there were only half a dozen members there and they were all um, older people, um, you know, say, you know, 60 plus years of age. Um, and then I met some other people and they, um, you know, talked about um, several other churches where the main congregation were older people. And we were uh, talking about that, you know, why younger people aren't um, uh, coming along to church and and so I- interested in faith so much. And one of the conclusions was that you know, the effect of the teaching of evolution in our schools and particularly long ages that the earth is, um, you know, and lo- uh, millions of years old or billions of years old, they teach, don't they, and life on earth is, is certainly, uh, or similarly, they say, you know, several billion years old possibly uh, according to their calculations. So these um, these claims, the claims of evolution, the claims of long ages seem to you know, contradict the Bible. But that's what we're being taught. That's what the media is, the the general secular media is is pushing all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, we even see uh, billboards uh, about some, um, you know, national park item or gorge or something, and they'll refer to, to me into years. So really our whole um, Western culture um, and it probably extends, you know, worldwide. Really, is is steeped in this whole view of uh, life on Earth being very old. And so, you know, I think really this is possibly one of the main reasons that people have um, uh, many people have have given up on on faith uh, in God, or or else, you know, they think, well, maybe there's something out there. But really, um, over the years, and I suppose it's been, you know, more than 50 years now that I've been uh, studying the Bible. I mean, I was baptised and accepted Jesus, my Saviour, in, in 1971. So for more than 50 years now, I've been studying the Bible and looking at it from a scientist's uh, perspective. Uh, so looking at the evidence for the prophecies, looking at the historical evidence, looking at archaeology um, and uh, the archaeological evidence for the Bible and, and so forth. And indeed, I've um, uh, authored or edited a, a number of books in this area and, um, you know, just recently I was talking to a, um, a senior uh, professor in the biological sciences at um, a large Australian university. And he was interested, for example, in, in the book that I published, The God Factor, um, uh, 50 Scientists and Academics Explain Why They Believe in God. And, of course, that book is still available under the title On the Seventh Day. Uh, 40 scientists explain uh, and academics explain why they believe in God. So if you look that up on um, on the internet, you can buy it through, you know, Amazon or um, uh, Kurong or, uh, you know, all the online booksellers. And, and similarly, of course, uh, many times I've discussed the other book, um, In Six Days, uh, 50 scientists uh, explain why they choose to believe in creation and a young earth and the biblical account of the history of the earth. And all those scientists have doctorates. Um, As I said, all the scientists have contributed to uh, the book on the seventh day. They they have been educated in secular universities and taught in secular universities. I also um, uh, edited uh, a book called The Big Argument, Does God Exist?, where we... um, a number of leading academics in their field um, present, again, the evidence that supports the Bible. So um, this is something I've been looking at for a long time. And I think the evidence is now overwhelming that the biblical account is an accurate account. And we now have you know mounting evidence um, you know, even, even for a young earth. And I think, you know, one of the very strong evidences 
for creation and so forth is, is again, is the impossibility of a biogenesis. In other words, it's absolutely impossible for non-living molecules to somehow form a living organism. And there was a, um, some, a number of... Um, uh, a short lecture videos have uh, been, been presented um, and uh, there's a very good site. Um, if you Google um, Discovery Science News, Discovery um, what Science News, if you just put run them all together um, and do a Google search on that, you'll come up to with the... Um, the Discovery Institute, which is a, an institute that supports intelligent design, um, and um, again, if you went, um, if you just uh, entered into your search engine, you know, YouTube.com um, forward slash user forward slash Discovery Science News forward slash search or you wouldn't even have to add search on the end so that's www.youtube.com forward slash user forward slash discovery science news or one word um, there will be a number of um, presentations uh, come up there but uh, there's uh, a four-part series which is very good on the origin of life and how the origin of life is absolutely impossible. It's presented by a guy with a PhD and it's been reviewed by five other guys uh, also with doctorates uh, in re related areas. And again, it explains why... You know, for long, not we. You can have put all your molecules together. You can even put your DNA and your cell membrane and everything together, but it's not going to make it alive. And they point out that in this section, um, the uh, one of the important things is that you have to have energy to make it alive. And to get energy, you've got to have a gradient and you've got to also have machines that can convert the energy stored in that gradient into the energy requirements for the cell. And that requires very complex machines, huge amount of design features in a living cell. But one of the other things that I think is really coming to light now, again, is the evidence for young ages, that life on Earth is young. And in um, the journal National Science Review um, that was published, uh, one of the issues in 2020, um, it's volume seven, number four, pages 815 to 822, an article by uh, A.M. Bailey and others. It was titled The Evidence of Proteins, Chromosomes and Chemical Markers of DNA in Exceptionally Preserved Dinosaur Cartilage. And this is where uh, essentially the, the research team found evidence of proteins, chromosomes and other chemical markers of di uh, dinosaur DNA in the remains of a duck-billed dinosaur. And... Um, it was interesting, uh, uh, that was one of the um, dinosaurs who uh, discovered dozens of uh, fragments of the remains of baby dinosaurs uh, in the Two Medicine Formation in northern Montana back in the 1980s. And um, when they just more recently examined one of the skulls, they uh, the two research team identified cartilage cells um, and um, other structures uh, resembling nuclei and, and chromosomes. So it's, and they were able to uh, uh, apply chemical stains to these that react, for example, with DNA. And um, they were also able to uh, uh, confirm double-stranded DNA with a minimum length of six base pairs present in in um, the cells. And one of the interesting things is that research was has been done uh, looking at how long DNA would last under ideal conditions, remember. And because these duckbill dinosaurs were in uh, strata that was dated at 75 million years old, right, what we, what we typically hear. But... Um, but DNA would be, uh, according to studies that were done of the chemistry of DNA, totally fragmented to um, at least one um, base pair 
after about uh, less than 7 million years, even if frozen at minus 5 degrees. And, um, but um, it's, uh, you know, if it was um, uh, stored, at, you know, at warm, 15 degrees, um, it would only be last about 10,000 years. Um, and so um, it's interesting that DNA is stored as, at 15 degrees for about, um, for a long period of time, the degradation would, uh, would have perhaps broken down to about 13 base pairs. So again, uh, at 10,000 years. So again, the fact that they're finding these fragments fits again with this short time period. So... At 15 degrees C, the DNA uh, would last about 10,000 years. Um, and the, so the fact that we're finding this um, DNA in these dinosaurs, again, points them to only thousands of years old. But other very strong evidence, uh, again, for uh, young earthers coming out in the discovery of a number of fossils preserved in, in amber. Now... Amber is uh, the fossilised tree resin, um, and usually from conifer-type uh, trees. Um, resin is actually part of the tree's defence uh, system, and so when a tree is damaged by animals or insects, um, it releases this sticky resin, and I'm sure many people have seen um, this sort of sticky uh, resin-type uh, uh, material um, on the side, particularly of a pine tree. Um, like a radiata pine, something like that. And this essentially plugs the wound and steals and ser- sterilises it. And it prevents insects and, you know, fungi then a- getting into the tree through the damage uh, section. Um, for the resin to become amber, it first needs to be buried uh, where it begins to harden and it's then called copal. And as more heat and pressure is applied, chemical transformations occur to the structure um, and it uh, turns into this hard uh, resin-like material. Um, Now, it's regularly claimed by evolutionists that amber takes millions of years to form. Um, However, that's just a a claim. Uh, They're really not sure how long the processes actually uh, take. But one of the things is that um, we find some, there have been some really, really well preserved specimens of ancient life preserved in amber. Um, one of these was a, uh, uh, a caterpillar um, from, uh, that was preserved in some uh, uh, Baltic lamb, amber. Uh, from the Baltic area, and it's actually preserved in a in a looping motion. So again, uh, so in this case, as a classic case of obviously, it would appear to be rapid preservation. Um, there are five uh, well-preserved uh, beetle species have been found in uh, Myanmar, uh, amber, amber from Myanmar, um, and they were assigned to species. Now. They uh, alleged that the um, beetles were 99 million years old, but these were beetles that were in, you know, currently living uh, genera. Um, and so the, the beetles, when they were studied, were extremely morphologically close to their living counterparts. In other words, there hadn't been any evolution, any evolutionary changes. So that genera had changed very little even over that really long period of time. Um, Evolution, of course, is supposed to be about, you know, change. Um, And um, over long periods of time, things are supposed to be changing. So it's quite clear that there hadn't been change in these um, in these beetles, um, the um, the caterpillar that was found in Baltic am- amber and reported relatively recently in 2019 um, was uh, from its family uh, Geometridae, 
Um, it's only a very small caterpillar, uh, about five millimetres long. Um, and um, these caterpillars um, move in a, a very special manner called looping. So they push their rear legs towards the front ones and the middle of the body loops upward and then stretch their bodies out again. And so this specimen um, became preserved in that looping uh, position, which is uh, quite fascinating. Um, again, it was dated at about 44 million years. Um, but again, uh, what we can see is that it's exactly the same as the modern caterpillar and its type of motion is the same. It hasn't changed. There hasn't been those changes. Um, another one were two species of um, very well-preserved uh, cockroaches. Um, these were a type of cave-dwelling cockroaches uh, that live in cave environments. Um, they were also found in the Myanmar uh, amber. And... Um, Again, the amber was dated at uh, 99 million years old, um, meaning, uh, of course, in terms of evolutionary uh, theory, that would make them the oldest cave-dwelling animals ever preserved. Um, uh, again, they're fairly tiny little um, creature, again, only about five millimetres long, um, but they shared the same typical features with modern cave cave-dwelling cockroaches, such as small eyes, extremely long antenna, paler pigmentation, reduced wing size, all these sort of things. Now, it's fascinating that these specimens were found amongst more than 100 tonnes of amber removed from a mine. Now, how would you get 100 tonnes of amber material, again, you know, um, together? And it's interesting that trees aren't found inside, you know, caves. <laughs> and uh, so, again, how is it likely that these creatures became trapped in, in this amber? Um, another really fascinating one was the case of an uh, amber-encased insect attached to a dinosaur jaw. Now, that's a, that's a special one. Um, and this was discovered in uh, Alberta, Canada, in the Dinosaur Provincial Park, and uh, a seven centimetre wide chunk of amber containing an aphid, which was a sap-sucking insect, was stuck to the jawbone from a hadrosaur dinosaur. And uh, the researchers hypothesised that the jawbone and the fresh sticky resin in which the insect had been trapped both just happened to be washed into a river at the same time where they came in contact. So, um, of course, this is an incredibly unlikely chain of events. But um, uh, another one, a sensational um, other find in amber was that of a, um, a, um, a hummingbird-sized dinosaur being uh, found. And uh, in reality, of course, it actually turned out to be uh, a bird skull. Um, so they thought it was a little hummingbird-sized dinosaur piece that had been found, but in actual fact, it turned out to be a bird skull. Um, and this tiny little bird had a little skull about one and a half centimetres long. And uh, so now it's thought to be um, uh, the bee hummingbird um, or similar to the bee hummingbird and uh, one of the smallest known birds. So it's interesting that um, these uh, creatures again were found in this um, amber. Um, the, it's interesting the researchers made no attempt to explain how a decomposed um, decapitated bird skull came to be trapped in amber along with a, a range of snail shells and plant material. But, you know, when we think about these examples of um, previous little animals, birds, uh, bits of dinosaur, insects, trapped in, um, in amber, um, 
how can we explain this in, in something that just oozes out of a tree? Well, the, the flood scenario, Noah's flood, really um, provides a very reasonable explanation um, in, in matter of fact, all of those um, interesting amber um, encased fossils would perhaps be better explained with a, a global flood about four and a half thousand years ago. We, I guess when we think about it, the flood was a major catastrophic event. You know, forests would have been just ripped up. We know some of them form massive coal seams and, and so forth. And, uh, but as these forests were travelling together in the uh, water and smashed against one another under the turbulent uh, situation, um, they would have released large quantities of resin. So these freshly uprooted trees being smashed together it, um, and this st- sticky resin, of course, can float and it would have trapped and encased other small items that were also floating in the water, such as wide range of insects, small animals, plant material. So we know that the flood was a massive supernatural event too. We mustn't forget that. The flood was a massive supernatural event designed to destroy um, humankind on the earth because it had become so wicked. And, of course, most of the surface of the earth and with the plan to to repopulate it again. And when you think about the flood as the only explanation that we have to explain these massive sedimentary deposits that are spread all over the world, you know, like the Morrison Formation that spreads from New Mexico to Canada, you've got massive amounts of material that are spread over huge areas. This is no little small local event. It's a massive worldwide event that uh, could happen there. And um, which, uh, and again, explains why, you know, um, the insect was stuck to the dinosaur bone being swept along in floodwaters, far more reasonable account. And large amounts of the resin were then buried rapidly uh, under huge quantities of sediment, which provided the pressure and the heat required for the chemical transformation into ember. So when we think about the flood scenario, uh, which explains why we find amber in such large deposits, you know, when you um, think about a 100 tonne deposit, that's just one deposit of amber, uh, we can't. We don't see today any natural processes that I'm aware of, anyway, that produce these sort of quantities of amber. But we can see the flood scenario of again massive forests ripped out, sm- the tree, fresh trees smashed together, the amber oozing out everywhere, floating, then becoming conglomerated, and as they're floating around, things are being tossed around. Different things are being, uh, you know, trapped in them. Um, and it's amazing the number of fossils that they do find trapped in amber around the around the world, and um, and the flood explains the coal deposits too. You know, near where I live, they have massive coal deposits, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of open cut mining uh, being done, and you can see the immense size of these deposits. And talking to to miners too, they find. Yeah, you know, the remnants of, of large trees um, at times uh, clearly evident in these um, in these coal uh, structures that have been been coalified and and yet uh, preserved, and um, and you know things such as tree roots and these sort of things. So the circumstances in which amber is found and the inclusions inside certainly frustrate the evolutionary dogma of long ages because, you know, slow um, deposits aren't going to form these amber deposits. Such finds also don't really point to tens to millions of years of evolutionary stasis um, or droplets of resin falling from tree roots into a cave. Um, so... You know, the evolutionary explanations that are sometimes put for these things just really don't fit. Um, uh, One article that um, was published by Philip Robinson, um, and he concludes that 
these um, fossil um, amber specimens are instead like God's little time capsules, testifying, he writes, testifying to a huge catastrophic event in which large amber fossils deform, namely the watery judgment that God sent upon the earth around four and a half thousand years ago. And so again, this is just another piece of evidence that um, fits the young earth global flood scenario. No evolutionary changes uh, because that's the way God created them um, and uh, preserved them. And we may need to remember too that when these ages are, are dated, the radiometric dating, we need to remember there are no reference rocks to actually validate the radiometric dating methods that are used. And instead, when we do carbon-14 dating, of course, we find the carbon-14 is there in most specimens that are, are tested like this. And again, this points to them only being thousands of years old and it's a much more reliable and relevant method of dating these sort of things. So we're, again, accumulating more and more evidence for a young earth. So you've been listening to Faith and Science. And remember, if you want to re-listen to these programs, just Google 3ABN Australia, that's all one word, .org, .au, and click on the radio button, and then on the different programs, Faith and Science. And again, um, mention to your friends about the program, put the links up on social media so that other people can look up these programs. And of course, there have been many programs in the the past uh, that cover a wide range of, of topics. And again, I try to include the references so that when you go back and listen, to these programs, if you want to check out the data, if you want to check out the actual uh, research papers and check for yourselves firsthand uh, the sources uh, that relate to these issues, um, that that's why I put them there and I mention them there. So again, you can go back and and listen. Um, and write down these references. And remember too, um, the the books uh, in six days um, are widely available um, and also websites such as creation.com which have a huge uh, list of videos and articles that again confirm the biblical account of how we came to be here. I'm Dr John Ashton. Have a great day. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio. 